Thank you so much to all of our Lightning Talk presenters today. We're going to go ahead and start with Charles Brothers. I'm going to wait for my slides to come up before I start my timer. That's entirely fair. <laughs> I am technically sharing the screen, so if the comms booth could share the slides that I'm sharing. Awesome. Okay. Are we ready? We are ready and go. Sounds good. So the United States global positioning system is ubiquitous. It services the world, providing billions of users with position, navigation, and timing at a high accuracy. Because this service is freely available, it is widespread and incorporated into technologies ranging from cars to your cell phone. Now, therefore, it comes as no surprise that a satellite navigation service is desirable for lunar exploration. In fact, ESA's Moonlight Initiative, NASA's LunNet Interoperability, and China's recently announced Lunar Constellation all incorporate satellite-based lunar navigation services. In the wake of a successful commercial crew and cargo program and planned commercial lunar payload services, one possible approach is for private industry to provide navigation as a service. If private industry is to provide such a service, the service needs to be economically viable. What I present here is a cost breakdown for the GPS system. Those colors are different, but that's okay. Both satellite cost and annual operating costs are displayed. As we consider both market size and cost analyses, it is reasonable to anticipate that a commercially provided lunar satellite navigation service will be different from GPS. Perhaps they will incorporate lunar ground stations and a clever balance of chip scale atomic clocks and more frequent timing updates. Or perhaps the service will moderate the accuracy, providing a, a user specified degree of precision. And Charles, I'm afraid your time has elapsed. Oh, that's the red. It'll be different. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. As a reminder to our speakers, that red border means you have 30 seconds remaining. Hi, I'm Shanti Garman. I'm with the University of Washington Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, uh, working with Professor Josh Smith in the Sensor Systems Lab. We're excited to be part of a NASA Tipping Point project together with GRC, Astrobotic, Wibotic, and Bosch Research to bring wireless power solutions to the lunar surface in 2023. Advances in wireless power are all around us. Just think back to when you had to plug your cell phone in to charge, and now you can simply rest it on a charging pad. But what if that device didn't have to make contact, but could simply charge in proximity? And what if charging could occur even when that device is out of alignment, like what might happen when a lunar rover is parked on uneven terrain? Wireless power transfer with magnetically coupled resonators, MCR, makes this possible. MCR enables high power transfer efficiencies, even with big misalignments, and it's the core technology in Wibotics charging solutions, which are established, well established on Earth. But going to the moon invites the question, what happens to a magnetic field in a, a magnetic field based system when its antennas are coated in lunar regolith, dust which is known to contain metallic iron, a magnetic material. In this work, we present experimental results of magnetically coupled resonators with wireless charging with four lunar simulants plus two iron powders. The good news, we invite you to visit our poster to find out. Good. Please go ahead. Good up. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin Hubbard. To encourage the sustainable development of lunar resources, we recommend developing an international governance regime with three primary responsibilities, to manage lunar mining activities, to safeguard the lunar environment, and ensure equitable access. The regime, which we are calling the Lunar Resource Management Authority, is inspired by the International Seabed Authority, the only international organization responsible for managing mining activities in areas beyond national jurisdiction. 
We recommend implementing a contract system for issuing rights over allotted areas of the lunar surface. An entity would submit an application in the form of a contract to the Lunar Resource Management Authority for exclusive but temporary rights over a limited number of mining blocks. To facilitate the contract process, we propose a mining map tool, a zoomed in part is displayed on the slide, based on temperature, slope, and access to power and communications. This tool divides a defined resource system, in this case it is the Lunar South Pole from 80 degrees poleward, into a grid of one by one kilometer mining blocks. We have classified each mining block based on their suitability for mining and whether a block would require additional restrictions from mining since the environmental conditions are requisite for other sectors operations. If you're interested in our mining map, regime recommendations, or proposed regulations, please check out our poster or send me an email. Thanks. Excellent, thank you. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Ian Jakupka. I'm the fuel cell technology lead at NASA Glenn Research Center. Today I'm going to talk about regenerative fuel cell energy storage, in particular what we're doing with the regenerative fuel cell project. And like most fuel cell folks, I'm excessively verbose and I'm likely to get pulled first. So um, what are we doing in this project? No technology solves every requirement for every application. And this is exceptionally true for energy storage on the lunar surface. The most mature technology are lithium ion batteries with a specific energy at the system level of approximately 160 watt hours per kilogram. The regenerative fuel cell technology has the potential for up to four times that, depending on your system scale and energy needs. Uh, there have been a number of terrestrial and laboratory demonstrations of the regenerative fuel cell technology but none of these have evaluated life, durability, or operation in a simulated lunar environment. The RFC project is going to evaluate all three of those things. And the culmination of this particular project is going to be a closed loop operation in a thermal vacuum chamber simulating the lunar environment. We also have uh, a number of component life tests and durability assessments that are going on in this project. If you have questions, the poster's on the left. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Hi, I'm Alex Morino. Uh, I work with Dr. Blair Bretman at Georgia Tech. And so a little bit about our work. We're trying to leverage direct ink write or robocasting 3D printing to extrude dense paste of regolith. Um, and then solidify them with UV light, which is relatively low energy consuming compared to other additive manufacturing methods. Um, so there's two main challenges that we've been encountering when trying to do this. The first is material extrusion. The second is the UV solidification in the presence of a large number of particles that impair the light transmission, reflect it, absorb it. Um, and so a little bit of the work you'll see outside of my poster is that we've been able to solidify model particles uh, suspensions of model particles up to 70 volume percent particles. Um, and interestingly enough, we've been able to also do this at sub-zero temperatures. So placing this printer in the Martian or lunar environment, the reaction of the photopolymerization reaction is still going to be able to carry, be carried out. Um, and then we also use rheology on the, under material extrusion on, on the right. Uh, we use rheology as a precursor test to see whether a certain volume percent of particles will be able to be extruded. And so that allowed us to show that 70 volume percent particles would be able to be printed, which we also demonstrated. And then we applied that to a regular suspension, MGS-1. Um, that we encountered a problem at 60 volume percent, but we've been leveraging alternative methods to push that further up. Um, and you can see more work on this topic on the poster because I don't have enough time to go over all of it. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a video if you can get it going. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jared Matthews. I'm the founder and CEO of Venturi Astrolab, a venture-backed startup based in Hawthorne, California. Uh, Astrolab is developing the multifunctional flexible logistics and exploration rover, or FLEX, uh, rover to take advantage of all the tremendous landing capability that NASA is currently investing in. Uh, soon, commercial landers will begin delivering tens to even hundreds of tons of cargo in a single landing. 
At Astrolab, we think this offers the opportunity to rethink uh, how surface systems are approached and to start achieving economies of scale with the systems that this community is developing. So I really appreciate the MOSA group for teeing this up for me. Um, inspired by the global uh, ship supply chain and the way we move goods around Earth via standardized uh, intermodal containers, Astrolab has developed Flex around a modular cargo concept uh, that gives it the rover tremendous versatility. As you can see in this video, uh, we can support a wide array of activities including surface logistics, crew transport, infrastructure deployment, science, resource utilization, construction, and other activities that are critical to a sustained presence on the moon. Uh, the unique wheel on limb mobility system allows Flex to collect, transport, and deploy payloads by raising and lowering our chassis to the ground. The payloads can each be more than three cubic meters in volume and 1,500 kilograms in mass. Um, the real utility of Flex comes from whatever payload happens to be attached. Um, and uh, we recently published our payload interface guide uh, for a full-scale, fully functional software development prototype that we regularly take to the field. And uh, we'd like to encourage this community to start uh, incorporating this idea into their proposals, and we'd love to, to work with some of you and, uh, and actually you know, um, co-develop uh, payloads that uh, adhere to, uh, to this standard and, and ultimately uh, enable all your dreams to come true on the lunar surface. Thanks. Hello, my name is Ann Parsons, and I would like to invite you to come by my poster in room 120 to talk about a really exciting new instrument for lunar resource prospecting. The Bulk Elemental Composition Analyzer, or BECA, uses neutron activation gamma ray spectroscopy to measure a wide variety of elements, you know, well beyond hydrogen, um, over a, about a, um, square meter area and down to a depth of 20 to 30 centimeters. When you put Becca on a rover, then you can, like the cartoons show, you can map an area of the lunar surface in the near, in the near surface for elements and materials that would be interesting and useful for in situ resource utilization. So this offers a lot of possibilities and um, I'm really excited, so I hope I'll see you some see some of you there. Thank you. Wonderful job. Hi, uh, I'm Catherine Pavlo. I'm a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, and I'm here talking about some work I've been doing with Viper. Uh, as we all know, Viper is launching soon, and I'm sure everyone's very excited about that. One of the really cool things about Viper is that it has a suspension system we haven't really used before on the moon or Mars that's pretty different from the six-wheeled rovers we've been seeing on more recent planetary exploration missions. Uh, Viper has a active suspension with uh, three actuators per wheel. There's a drive actuator, a steer actuator, and a suspension position actuator that can be used to control either positional pose or downward force. And while this presents a lot of opportunities for mobility, it does also increase the risks in that there are more actuators to fail uh, and the potential impact of a joint failure could be larger, particularly if there are only four wheels rather than six. I've been doing some work looking at the potential impact on mobility of individual joint loss. Uh, and the good news is not all joint loss is mission ending. The bad news is some of it might be. Uh, if you'd like to hear more about what the impact of various joint failures are and how we can potentially try to mitigate some of it, come talk to me at my poster. Thanks. Great job. Good afternoon. Uh, at Mission Control, we develop software for Earth, Moon, and Mars with a focus on mission operations, onboard autonomy, and AI. And to put simply, what that means is if you have a payload that you want to fly to space, regardless of whether it's a rover, a lander, a satellite, and it requires software on board, we can help you with that. And the way we do that is by helping you throughout the stack, software stack. Um, we have developer tools that allow your software engineers and developers to uh, communicate with the lower down payloads and you know the hardware at the hardware level. So think of it, think of it as the operating system or the underlying piping. Uh, for software. So this is where some of the modularity and open source stuff that we're doing really makes sense, especially given that uh, we're, we're, there was just a panel discussion on it. 
Then we have the end-to-end -end messaging system with a standardized user interface, regardless of whether you're operating a robotic arm or a rover or a scientific instrument. We can provide you with standardized user interface that you can customize to your need. And then on top of that, we can provide you with onboard autonomy and artificial intelligence that you might need to do some onboard processing. Things like object detection, image segmentation, uh, visual odometry, and things like that. My poster is in room 121. Please come find me. Let's talk about uh, space robotics. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is John uh, from NC State Mechanical Engineering. So uh, my topic is uh, passive dust mitigation. And passive dust mitigation uh, utilizes a micro topographic surface inspired, inspired by nature. So such microstructure can be um, fabricated by uh, photolithography or laser micro machining, uh, which use rigid substrate. However, in the space application, um, it is desirable to have a flexible and large area and multifunctional coating. Okay, so we created a very noble and cre um, uh, creative method to make a such theme. So we exploit um, defect mechanism in the roll coating uh, process. So you have seen this kind of phenomenon when you painted your wall using the roller brush, right? So this system is a simple and scalable and robust. And so we, we fabricated um, many functional themes, uh, such as the CNT um, composite theme, which, is, which shows a super hydrophobicity and um, electrical conductivity. And the silicon nanocomposite, um, which has a wavelength selectivity. So it, can transpa uh, tra it is transparent in the UV and visible, but emits, um, emit the infrared, which is uh, desirable for the um, a solar cell panel and also the thermal radiator. Hi, my name is Hunter Williams. I'm from Honeybee Robotics. I'm the technology development manager there, and I am the PI for uh, LAMPS. So this is our, uh, our system with the Lunar Vertical Solar Array Technology uh, Program. We, we're one of several phase one winners and uh, hoping for phase two, but we are committed to developing LAMPS no matter what. It's a, this is a 10 kilowatt uh, mobile deployable lunar vertical solar array. Uh, some of the key technology that we've put into this is the Diablo deployable boom. So this is a, a low mass uh, boom that can take quite a bit of uh, weight at the top and it's scalable. So if you need a small boom, large boom, uh, single deployment, multiple deployment, we can make something for that. Uh, we have also developed with uh, Mpower technologies, uh, some extremely lightweight uh, solar cells that will, be, uh, that will be key for making this possible. One of the important things for the long term with LAMPS is that we think that this kind of technology is going to be key for jumpstarting the lunar grid. So Honeybee has uh, designs on the moon. We would like, we would like to be the first uh, power salesman on the moon, uh, first PG&E but with less forest fires. And, uh, and, we would, uh, and we'd like to work with you all to help uh, figure out exactly how that'll work. So we're releasing the dust tolerant uh, connector standard uh, eventually, hopefully in the very near future, so that you guys can help us figure out how to connect and uh, we can actually give you power. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Mike Zanetti. I'm at Marshall Space Flight Center. I'm uh, a lunar and planetary geologist and also the principal investigator for the Kinematic Navigation and Cartography Knapsack. This is an STMD-funded early career initiative project um, that'll be coming to a close this, uh, at the end of this fiscal year. Um, and it's ostensibly to develop um, a, a development test article for uh, frequency modulated continuous wave LIDAR for 3D terrain mapping and navigation. Um, it is a backpack mounted mobile LIDAR scanner uh, with also applications for rovers and, um, and autonomous navigation. It's essentially a self-driving car sensor uh, put on a backpack. And you can think of this as like a Google car, right? What you see in the video here is the main advantage of FMZW LIDAR, uh, which is 
uh, providing Doppler velocity for every point in a point cloud uh, uh, produced by the, uh, by the LIDAR. So you see HD video there, uh, LIDAR range, which is out to about 500 meters, depending on configurations, and also that Doppler shift. So red shift is moving away and blue shift is moving towards. And as you watch this, um, this quadcopter land, you actually see a rotational dust vortex being kicked up in what's arguably the uh, coolest picture of myself ever taken. Uh, we're also doing this um, live time for no light personal navigation. So with heads up display and the backpack, we can wander around in the desert at night with no light and still survive. Um, and then all of the applications of this are not just a live time navigation hazard avoidance tool, but also you can concatenate all these point clouds and create beautiful 3D maps at centimeter scale resolution, uh, meaning five centimeter per pixel. Has elapsed. Yep. Thank you to all our in-person presenters. At this point, we're gonna move on to our virtual presenters, starting with Sergio Alvarez. Sergio, are you ready to speak? Um, yes, I am. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, the first slide of the space science test and evaluation facility, step one, is the initial proof of concept for a commercial service that will enable Aegis Aerospace's customers to test new technologies on the lunar surface. Step one is a fully funded 10 kilogram payload scheduled to launch in the first quarter of 2025 with seven technology experiment demonstration partners. Step one includes technologies from several clients for evaluation of their technologies to perform in the unique lunar environment. <clears throat> we are working with intuitive machines uh, to integrate the step one test bed onto an upcoming Nova Sea lunar lander that will launch, land on the moon and position step one to perform lunar operations with our hardware and our client's technologies and transmit data from the moon back to earth. Uh, upon completion of the mission, Aegis Aerospace will incorporate a TRL-9 STEF platform into its space testing as a service line of business. Virtually any customer will be able to purchase STEF capacity to demonstrate new technologies on the lunar surface. Irregular cadence of commercial STEF missions will increase the technology readiness level for customer test articles and reduce risks associated with incorporating new technologies into the lunar exploration infrastructure. Thank you very much. Um, we'll see you in the, uh, the gather. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. <laughs> Next up, we have Michael Evans. Michael, are you ready? I am ready. Uh, ready. My name is Michael Evans. I'm at the Johnson Space Center, where I work in the division where we have the lunar curation staff. And we are also the team that's working with a lot of the EVA crew developing tools and uh, capabilities for the lunar surface. What you're seeing is Gandalf staff. This is a working prototype developed over the last two years using STMD funding. It is basically a self-powered utility pole. At its heart, the Gandalf staff is a way for the astronaut to use a tool, a power tool while they're doing EVA to augment auxiliary lighting in the dim dark shadows of the South Pole providing a LIDAR. One of my collaborators is Mike Zanetti, who you just saw giving his NAC um, presentation. It has a camera for 360 degree photogrammetry. It provides a comm and nav relay for places that are hard to reach. And it provides a sample documentation for the curation staff. As we develop this, we realize that there's more utility than just as an EVA tool. This could be a comm cell phone tower. This could become a light street light. Um, all of this is basically powered by a bunch of iron lithium uh, phosphate batteries. Um, we have now uh, experimented with developing it as an all -SEP type science platform where you put the solar arrays in a separate battery storage system. You can attach instruments to it. And we have demonstrated um, a geothermal probe mocking the uh, exact same instrument that was developed during Apollo to measure subsurface temperatures. And we're open to talking about more instrument designers and more capabilities for infrastructure development using the Gandalf staff. My name is Michael Evans, michael.e.evans at nasa.gov. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. See you okay. Next up, we have John Graff. 
John, are you ready? I am. Uh, I, I will support this poster virtually, uh, but this is Ian Jakupka's idea, and he's at the meeting. So if you see him, talk to Ian about it. Um, about six years ago, our group started a project with AES uh, sponsorship to use ion transport membranes, ceramic elements, to uh, separate uh, oxygen from air and pressurize it. Our goal is to take cabin air and the oxygen in cabin air and create uh, high pressure, high purity oxygen to recharge the oxygen tanks for spacesuit operations. Uh, about four years ago, Ian said, you know, you got a solid state device that produces unambiguously pure product and you can receive a mixture of mostly oxygen and contaminants that absolutely does not meet uh, any propellant grade specs. And so when your technology is ready, you start to start talking to the ISRU guys to see if you can merge some of the ISRU technologies with these uh, ceramic ion transport membranes so that you can pressurize the product and, and deliver a, a high purity stream to top off the ISRU. Um, I'll stand at the poster and talk about all the nerdy details about manufacturing technology and power and purity, resistance to poisons. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, if you're interested in those sorts of things, I'll be at the poster. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Next up, we have Kevin Grossman. Hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Kevin Grossman. Uh, I am the PI of the Molten Regolith Electrolysis Reactor um, efforts going on at KSC. Um, what's being presented is the result of an early career initiative project uh, where we partnered with Honeybee Robotics and RDO Induction. Uh, to investigate the best way to demonstrate what's called a cold wall reactor design for the molten regolith electrolysis reactor, uh, which is an important design feature of a, of a reactor in order to allow for uh, molten regolith to stay at temperature during operation through only dual heating. Um, the aim of the project was to investigate the best way to produce an initial melt uh, through what we're calling a, a reactor starter device. Once the melt is produced, the reactor design should be uh, self-sustaining through joule heat from the electrodes. Um, but we investigated uh, resistive heating, uh, solar heating, and induction heating. Um, we found through several of our, our samples that the, the heating of the regolith, even in uh, vacuum is very porous. Uh, we ended up uh, selecting an induction heater as, as our method for producing a melt in an electrolysis cell. And in the bottom right there, you see we have uh, an experimental facility at KSC for the development of the MRE reactor in which we will be uh, demonstrating a uh, cold wall dual heated reactor shortly. Thank you very much, Kevin. <laughs> Next up, we have Matthew Kuhns. Hello, I'm Matthew Kuhns with Maston Space Systems. We're a space infrastructure company uh, working on transporting and, and delivering science and pay payloads across the solar system. And today I'm going to talk to you about four of our technologies for lunar, uh, lunar infrastructure and science. The first one is NIGHT. This is a non-nuclear, non-battery technology for surviving the lunar night and exploration of permanently shadowed regions. You can deploy it on a, a spacecraft or a rover, and it creates uh, heat for up to, up to 12 months to help you survive those very, very cold temperatures. Another technology we're excited about is our fast landing pads. So this kind of solves the problem of how do you land a very large vehicle on the moon without a landing pad. This creates a landing pad during final descent in less than 15 seconds, and then you can safely land mitigating plume surface interaction effects and any sort of risk of ejected damage to your landing vehicle or the surrounding infrastructure. Another one is our rocket mining system for ISRU extraction, uh, in particular lunar water. And this, uh, you can see a, a demonstration of one of our tests in the image on the bottom right, but this can mine 
uh, up to you know over 400,000 kilograms of, of water per year, and it eliminates some of the wear and tear with traditional excavator or drill systems. And then our last system is uh, Lunar PNT. It's a deployable mesh network which we can drop from orbit onto the lunar surface in support of exploration and lunar science. If you have any questions, please stop by. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Next up, we have James Lewis. James, are you ready? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Greetings from the NASA Johnson Space Center. Like you said, my name is James Lewis, and I'm, a I'm with the Structural Engineering Division at the Johnson James, Space Center. I apologize. I may have spoken too soon. Yeah. Um, you're a little garbled. Uh, is it possible for you to try uh, reconnecting your audio? I I'm going to go try to go without the headphones at all. Okay. Are you attached to a VPN? Hang tight with us for just one moment, folks, while we troubleshoot. Oh, yeah. And you can try turning off your video as well. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Are we behind? James, are, are, can you try to speak? I apologize. It seems like we lost James's sound altogether. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to say we're going to move on and circle back to James. Um, James, if you want to try and leave the meeting and then reconnect, I uh, will uh, will re uh, lift you up to panelists. If the comms team could help with that, I would appreciate it. Um, so can we please move to um, Vishnu Senajapali? Vishnu, are you ready? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Vishnu Senajapali. I'm here on behalf of Honeybee Robotics and University of Arizona. For the past couple of years, we've been working on some exciting new science instrument and game-changing technologies, which I'll be presenting briefly here today. Uh, the primary science objective for this instrument is to get a better understanding of the moon by quantifying the distribution of lunar seismicity and the location of prominent moonquakes. Uh, similar to how we bury our seismometers on the Earth, we want to do something very similar on the moon by burying these sensors into the lunar surface. This allows us to decrease the thermal noise and the unwanted ringing of the fluffy, uncompacted regolith near the surface. Uh, we also came up with an exciting new deployment technology called Diablo, which is super compact during stowage and can deploy a two inch diameter stainless steel tube. As you can see the video on the right, it can deploy and retract up to two meters in length. So once our lander uh, spacecraft or spacecraft lands on the moon, we start by pneumatically drilling into lunar surface as we deploy Diablo. Because gas has a huge expansion factor due to vacuum, this evacuates the lunar regolith and allows us to drill through this extra extremely compacted regolith. Uh, we even went further and successfully demonstrated at the end-to-end -end instrument in our vacuum chamber, where we drilled through DP1, where we vacuum compacted it, and to achieve a instrumental maturity close to level six. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vishnu. <laughs> Next up, we have Micah Scheibel. Micah, are you ready? Yeah, I think you're gonna have to uh, let me have my video though. Oh, there it is, yeah. Great. Thanks. So my name is Micah Scheibel. I am a research scientist here at Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, over the last couple of years, I've been spending a lot of time developing a uh, ultra high vacuum dust charging system here at in our lab at Georgia Tech. Uh, the system that I've developed is able to uh, electrostatically charge dust under high vacuum conditions using either vibrational tribal charging, uh, exposure to UV light, or an electron bombardment. Uh, and I've also managed to uh, make a system that allows us to then loft that electrostatically charged dust using uh, applied potentials 
to then bring that dust into contact with various surfaces. Uh, some of our testing has looked into uh, using this electrostatically charged dust as a uh, proxy for the lunar dust, and then uh, looking at its interactions with a EDS technology. Uh, the EDS substrate that we're looking at here on the right was actually produced using chemically modified graphene oxide. Uh, we can make these in a variety of different types of patterns. Uh, right now, these are just running a two phase, uh, but we'll also uh, be moving into some three phase designs. Uh, and one cool thing that we've shown with our work is that when we apply e EDS and UV together, uh, we actually see a big, big enhancement in the uh, dust removal efficiencies. Uh, so I'll be at my poster. Let me know if you got any talks. Thank you very much, Micah. Next up, we have Justin Scheidler. Hello, everyone. I'm Justin Scheidler from NASA Glenn. I'll be giving a quick overview of the Motors for Dusty and Extremely Cold Environments project. This is an internal NASA project focused on R&D and ground testing, where uh, the goal is to develop two unheated rotational actuators that can operate for a long duration in extreme cold, so all the way down to 30 Kelvin. Uh, we're addressing the problem where grease lubricants will become inoper inoperable at cold temperatures. And this is especially important for gearing. So our approach is to completely eliminate gear lubrication. So we're developing one actuator that uses non-contact magnetic gearing uh, preliminary design of that is shown in the bottom right. And then we're developing one actuator that simply does not need any gears. Um, and that is a piezoelectric actuator, uh, preliminary design shown in the bottom left. Our scope includes relevant environment testing, the impact of lunar dust on life, and testing some commercial off-the-shelf components. Uh, we are not trying to advance the state of the art for bearings, dust seals, or other dust mitigation technology. Uh, we think these technologies are broadly applicable throughout the solar system, but we are focusing on the lunar PSR for now. Um, I've listed some promising applications. Uh, the magnetic actuators um, most promising for moderate to high power actuation, whereas the piezoelectric actuator is most promising for lower power, high precision actuation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Justin. Next up, we have Leo Stolov. Hey everyone, so my name is Leo Stolov. I'm a systems engineer at Honeybee Robotics, and I'll be talking about SMART, which stands for Sensing, Measurement, Analysis, and Reconnaissance Tool. And what it is essentially is a next generation resource prospecting drill, uh, the current generation being the Trident drill. What Trident does is it excavates a lunar regolith uh, down from a meter and brings it up to the surface for instrument analysis. What we're doing with SMART is we're packaging those instruments into the auger uh, so that we're bringing the instruments to the sample rather than bringing samples to the instruments. So what we have in the auger here is a near-infrared spectrometer, a neutron spectrometer, a dielectric spectroscopy probe, a temperature sensor and heater, and a visible light camera. So all these instruments together are meant to characterize the drill site and look for volatiles and water ice on the lunar surface. So what we have uh, been doing so far is developing a prototype uh, with hardware and uh, integrating these instruments into the auger. And our plans are to test all these instruments in a relevant lunar environment. Thanks. Thank you very much, Leo. Next up, we have Jeff Weimar. Hi, my name is Jeff Wehmeyer. I'm an assistant professor in mechanical engineering at Rice University. And this work was supported by an early career faculty grant. Sorry for the uh, sort of formatting overlap here. So the, our team is developing passive thermal control devices that trap heat uh, when the exterior temperature is very cold and then release that heat to prevent overheating during the lunar day. Our approach leverages temperature-dependent magnetic forces between magnetic materials near the Curie temperature of a material called gadolinium at around 20 degrees C. And so we use these temperature-dependent magnetic forces to make and break thermal contact uh, to allow or block heat conduction between surfaces. And we've leveraged this fundamental mechanism to create three different devices that may have future applications uh, in uh, passive thermal management. The first is an oscillating gadolinium thermal diode 
which enables one-way transmission of heat only when the thermal gradient is aligned with the direction of gravitational acceleration. We've demonstrated thermal rectification ratios ranging from 9 to 18. We've demonstrated a thermal relay in which the heat flow from a thermal source to a thermal drain is modulated by the temperature of the magnetic material on the gate. And we're working to develop new passive magnetic heat switches, uh, which act for thermal regulation with thermal turndown ratios around 40 under high vacuum conditions. I look forward to talking further at the poster session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Next up, we have, we have Benjamin Yelms. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Ben Yunus. I'm here today to talk to you about um, automating lunar site work. So I'm working with a team of graduate students here at the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon under our advisor, Red Whitaker. And um, we're creating this autonomy framework in ROS2 to build roads, uh, landing pads, and foundations on the moon without astronaut or ground teleop. Um, our approach is centered around testing our software um, on our in-house built platform, which we uh, designed from terrestrial earth moving priors and some heritage flight programs. Um, what we're doing is we're using live stereo terrain perception, and we're putting that into our planner uh, which is using a grading blade to move regolith, but this approach is very modular and could be put on um, pretty much any type of uh, modular vehicle or on a dedicated platform. Um, yeah, so our approach uh, is using coupled mobility and blade control uh, to get the most out of pushing stuff in low gravity with low mass and low energetics. And uh, the planner we're working on is uh, solving the problem of where do you push what to get a certain uh, surface morphology uh, optimally? So uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benjamin. All right, and last but not least, James, are you with us? James Lewis? Can you hear me now? It's not awesome. Can you hear me but now? I, yeah, there we go. I'm trying to get back up to your slides here. Sorry, I don't know what the technical problems are. I'll try to be quick then. Um, my name is James Lewis. I'm with the NASA Geontist Space Center in Houston, Texas. And we are with an organization that's responsible for the technical development of the International Docking System Standard. And as we all know, the near Earth space economy is exploding. More vehicles are visiting the ISS. New commercial destinations are coming online, more in, in conceptualization now. So these frontiers are opening up including the system lunar and lunar surface. So the IDSS, which is our in-space equivalent for docking standard, has been uh, instrumental in helping establish in-space human transfer capability for interoperability. Right now, there are no less than 10 unique companies building vehicles that will have IDSS docking systems on them, and we, with the goal that we hope that crew rescue will become possible in the not too distant future. We have significant lessons learned that we've learned over the last decade or so in the development of a standard. It takes years to develop in partnerships to do that. But we recognize there's a new class of surface mating systems which do not exist will be required for surface lunar activities. So we know that from our IDSS experience that lunar surface will be greatly benefited with the docking standard. We call this the IDSS-S for surface. It's already under consideration. We know that the lunar surface systems, we've seen a lot of that stuff, is being developed architecture and formulation. So but what we need is this one. We need to learn the lessons from the past and apply that to the future. We know that commercial industry has a huge role. And if you want to come hear more about the IDSS for the future standards, we have a demo opportunity later this year. We'd love to talk about it at the poster session. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much. So that concludes our lightning talk session. Now, um, just as a reminder,